like to welcome everybody here today. Those of you on our Skagit campus, glad that you're with us, as well as those online and here in the room at Gym Church, wherever you're coming from. Uh, good to have you here uh, today. You know, this time of year, there are three messages that I always hear. I hear it every single year. The first message this time of year that I hear every single year is, this is the last time we have to move our clocks. Because Congress is going to pass a law that finally daylight savings time will be permanent. And every year, I'm disappointed. But I hear that message every year. I don't know. This may be our government. I don't want to run for anything. But how difficult could it be to say, hey, all you congressmen and women, before you go to the senior center, can, are we OK with the, the time? Can we just get a show of hands? I mean, how easy would that be? OK, regardless. I'm getting this a little cathartic for me today. The second message I hear every year at this time is, this is the Mariners' year. <laughs> this is the year. And for those of you diehard Mariners fans, you have more faith than I do. <laughs> I would more quickly believe that Sasquatch was riding a unicorn on a flat earth than that this would be the year for the Mariners. But I hear that every single year. The third message I hear this time of year, every single year, is the message of the cross. The first two messages disappoint. But the message of the cross, while on the onset it might seem darker and even hopeless, it always comes about with victory and triumph. In Isaiah 53, this, this heavy chapter of the suffering Savior, the suffering servant, we read these words in verse 3. He was despised, is this prediction about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. I grew up singing this little song, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's the message of the cross, and that's the message that never disappoints. That's the message that never goes down in defeat. That's the message that we celebrate. We're in this series looking at the message that came from the shadow of the cross for the three hour, six hours that Jesus was hanging on the cross, these seven statements with this eternal impact, the statements were short. Part of that was just because of how difficult it was to even express anything in that position on the cross. Short and concise, but so profound. And one of the things that we did at the beginning of this series is that we handed out little crosses for you to keep for the entirety of this series. Cross is not as a, a lucky charm, not as some gimmicky thing, but just to remind us to keep our minds focused on the cross in this season leading up to Easter. And again, if you weren't here in the first couple of weeks of the series and you didn't pick one of these up, uh, you can pick one up on your way out today at the Information Center here and in Skagit. We've got a few more down there as well if you didn't get that. But to have that cross, to be reminded throughout this season of what Jesus did for us and what he said on the cross. So today, we're going to look at the fourth of these sayings on the cross. We're halfway through the series, and I will say this. Up to this point, we've been going in chronological order, but these last four are going to be a little bit out of order. It's not for uh, any real specific reason, except that I wanted to end with it is finished on Easter, so we've kind of mixed up the, the order for that. The second thing I want to say is that today's saying that we're going to look at is by far the shortest saying of Christ on the cross. Of the seven, this is the shortest one. And at, the, at just kind of a, the, the surface level, the, the initial look at it, it seems like it's pretty quick, pretty simple, pretty pragmatic. It's, it's pretty practical. What he's saying is just it's a physical need that he has, so he just expresses that. But Without too much digging in, without too much scholarship, you begin to realize, if you see it in the context of the verse, that it's not just that. It is that, but it's not just that. That there's a prophecy involved here as well. And what you find, if you dig a little deeper, is that while it's a, it meets this physical need and also fulfills a prophecy, that if you go deeper, there's a profound statement that's being made here, and you go even further, that it can become very personal for you and me. And so that's what I, we're going to look at today. I will say one more thing before we get into this, is that at the beginning of my sermon, at the first part of my sermon, I'm going to be telling some different things that, while somewhat related, might feel completely disjointed. That is by design. I understand that. Don't sit there and say, he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. He doesn't even know where he's going. I do. And hopefully, when it all comes together, it'll all kind of tie in. Because I want to tell you an experience that I had. Then I want to talk about some things that Jesus said the night before he was crucified. 
And then I want to kind of basically go through the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And then I want to point out two different conversations that Jesus had. And then, uh, again, land on Revelation, and then we'll get into the sermon. <laughs> so that's where we're going. You ready for that? Okay, let's do it. In the mid-90s, I had the great privilege to be able to travel to India on several occasions. Uh, and the primary reason for going to India was to work in Mother Teresa's homes. She has many, many homes. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, mission, missionaries of, of charity, uh, her and her sisters there, had these homes. And we would go on several occasions to go and volunteer in her homes. And there are different homes. There was the home for the orphans, the, the families that would just leave their babies on the doorstep. And they would take them in. They said, bring all your children. If you don't want them, bring them to us. And so there were these orphanages. We'd work in those. She had a home uh, for people that were physically and mentally um, disabled and um, a very difficult home to work in. Uh, we would go to the home where people who had leprosy lived and worked in that colony, and we would go there as well. And we would go to the home uh, for the dying and destitute, which is kind of what she was most famous for um, in those homes. All these different homes, Prim Dan and Dum Dum and Tittergra and, and then into um, Kaligat. And the home that I worked in the most on my trips over there was Kaligat. This is the home for the dying and destitute. This was the very first home that Mother Teresa opened up in 1952. She went into an area um, where there was an abandoned building that had been a Hindu temple. It had been in its day a Hindu temple that was dedicated to the worship of the goddess Kali. But it had since been abandoned, so she and her sisters just moved in and opened up this home to care for these dying individuals. Well, there were some Hindus that weren't real happy about it, went to the government, said she took our building, and they basically said, when you do what she does, you can have your building back. <laughs> and so it became her building, and it became this. And this is where I've spent most of my time volunteering. And the others I went as well, but this is where I spent most of my time. And we would go there, and we would feed these men who were dying. We would bathe them. We would do the laundry. We would, some of our individuals even did some medical care with them. And the whole concept of this for her was these people that had grown up in abject poverty, she wanted them on their, their dying days and their last breaths to have dignity. And she said that people ought to have a beautiful death. People that had lived and been treated like an animal ought to die like an angel having love and care. And so we would go and we would, we would work with these people who were dying. None of them were going to get better. They weren't going to get out of there. They were going to die. Well, one day we were doing the laundry and we were taking the laundry of the, of the soiled bed clothes and, and doing all this stuff. And then we would take them up onto the roof to hang them out to dry. And while on the roof, um, I took this picture. Um, there it is, right there. This picture. This is from the roof. And uh, you can see the, the old temple, but then you have this crucifix with Jesus and these two words, I thirst. This is a statement we're going to look at today. Very short, I thirst. And what was interesting is that it wasn't just out on the front of this building, it wasn't just out on the roof, that when we went down inside this building where we were working with these individuals, there was another crucifix with these words, I thirst. And when we went to the mother home, when we went to the chapel for vespers or for the morning prayers, there was a crucifix with these words, I thirst. And every home that we visited, there would be a crucifix with these words, I thirst, which got me a little curious. Now, I knew that it was one of the statements of Jesus from the cross, but why was this such a big deal in these homes of Mother Teresa and her sisters of charity? Well, it seems that in 1946... She was a, a young nun that had given herself to, to uh, the service of Jesus and his bride, the church. And on a train ride, she had this mystical vision as she saw the poverty of Calcutta and the surrounding areas. On that train ride, she saw a vision of Jesus hanging on the cross and looked at her and said these words, I thirst. And it gripped her. And she said, I've got to do something about this thirst of Jesus for the least of the least, the poorest of the poor, the, de the dying ones, the destitute ones. And it took her four years. She was not to be deterred at all, but four years for her to get permission to start her own order, her own society, these missionaries of charity. And so in 1950, with 11 other nuns, they started this mission. And two years later, they opened this first home in Kaligat. I thirst. Now, hold that. 
When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said these words, I thirst. But 18 hours before that, he had been in an upper room with his disciples. You know the picture of the Lord's Supper there, the, the, the dimension picture. And, and there he was with his disciples, and they were celebrating the Passover, this festival, this feast that, that the people of, of Israel had done for thousands of years. It celebrated them coming out of Egypt. And this is something they would do annually. And at the end of that meal, this is where Jesus washed his disciples' feet, and they had all these things. And it's the starting of the Eucharist, the, the communion, the Lord's Supper. At the end of the meal, it says, he took the cup, this chalice, what has been affectionately known now as the Holy Grail, but it was just a cup, a cup of wine, and he said these words to his disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. That had to have been absolutely confusing to these disciples. Is he talking metaphorically? Is he talking about that cup itself? And why do we need a new covenant? What's wrong with the old covenant? And a new covenant in his blood, the covenant we're celebrating, it was the blood of the lambs that was put over our doorpost. What about his blood and his blood that's poured out? It had to have been confusing for them, but he talks about this cup. And then they walked across the Kidron Valley over onto the Mount of Olives there into the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he was with 11 of his disciples. And he took three of them, Peter, James, and John, a little deeper into the garden. And then he went on even further to pray with such anguish and such torment that he began to sweat drops of blood. And in that time of prayer, he prayed these words, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Well, it's odd that within just an hour or so of each other, he's talking about this cup of a new covenant and this cup that he wants to have passed from him. It's like there's a, the, the cup that gives and the cup that takes. The, the cup of this new, new covenant was the cup that would give life. And this cup that he's asking, is there any way for it to be taken away? This would be the cup that would take his life. And the only way that he could even offer the cup that gives is to be willing to drink from the cup that takes the only way he could offer life was to give his own in this cup. And so he says in John chapter 18, verse 11, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Here's this cup, shall I not drink it? Now, hold that thought. Jesus, we know, is God. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Not only is he God, but he is the creator God. He is one with the Father, Right? That it says that, that through him all things have been created. Nothing has been created that has not been created by him. So at the beginning, you have creation. And according to that, then, Jesus being God, he is at creation. And at the creation account, there's all of this water. Everything is this chaos, but across the water. And he, he separates the upper from the lower. So that there's the sky with water in it, the clouds and such. And there's water down below. And then it says he separates the water so that there's the, the dry land and there's water. That he has control over the waters of the earth and the universe. As we saw a few weeks ago in Isaiah chapter 40, it says he holds the waters, if you remember, in the hollow of his hand. Interesting, when it came time to bring the Israelites out of Egypt in slavery, the water is turned into blood. But years later, Jesus would turn the water into wine. One would be death and a curse, one would be life and joy. That God would separate the waters of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the Red Sea and allow them to walk across on dry ground. He would part the waters. But years later, Jesus says, I'll just walk across the waters. Why part them? I'll walk on the sea. And while they're in the wilderness, it takes the bitter waters of Mara and makes them sweet. It takes the impossible nature of the thirst where there's now water coming out of a rock. And years later, Jesus would meet a woman at a well, and he had nothing to draw water from. And he meets her, and he's tired, it says, and he asks her for a drink of water. And there's this dialogue, because she's a Samaritan woman, and we've gone into that in the past, and it's a, an amazing conversation, 
But then Jesus says this to her in John chapter 4. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. To which she says, give me that water. I don't want to keep coming back to this well. And Jesus is saying that either he has access or he has the source of this living water that is so much greater than anything she's ever experienced. One more event that happened, you can find it in John chapter 7, I believe, is that it was on the festival of Sukkot, which is the the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. This was one of the three pilgrimage feasts of, of Jerusalem, of Israel, And that was that every year, if you were physically able, you were required to go to Jerusalem. So now there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people converging on this city. This would happen every every fall. It was the most joyous festival of, of their whole year. It was to celebrate the harvest and to pray that God would give them a great rainy season. And they would, they would live in these, these tabernacles, these little booths, these, these tents. It was like, a, it was like a, um, a big music festival. And they would live in these tents for seven days. And then there was this ceremony that the priest would take a golden pitcher and he would walk down from Jerusalem down to the, to the pool of Siloam and he would dip it into that pool and fill it with water and then go back up the hill, up to Jerusalem, up to the temple, into the altar, and he would pour this water out around the temple. And it happened every single day. And then on the final day of the festival, the eighth day, It would happen in even grand measure. And we see this on the last day. This is John chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, remember now, this is not with his 12 disciples. This is not with about 150 of those followers. This is with thousands and thousands of people, most likely in the temple courts where the priest has been pouring the water around the altar. And Jesus stands up and with a loud voice, he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Wait a second, Jesus. You're saying we should come to you? That somehow you have the answer? And he says, if you want something to really satisfy your thirst, your deepest thirst, you come to me. Interesting that in the Garden of Eden, when God made perfection, there was a river that ran from the Garden of Eden. And in the book of Revelation, in the new heaven and the new earth, with the new Jerusalem, there's a river It runs through the city. And at the end of the book of Revelation, we read these words. Come, whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. All right. Those are all my disjointed pieces. Let's see if we can kind of bring them all together. So here is Jesus This one who creates and controls all the waters of the earth. This one who can walk on water, part water, change water. This one who offers living water. This this one who who, um, has, has offered it not only to a Samaritan woman, but to thousands of Jewish people. This source of the living water. And now he hangs on a cross. And the source of living water is parched. Well, Jesus hangs on the cross with lips that are cracked, a throat that is dry, in a raspy voice, he whispers out these words, I thirst. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about the irony of this. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Spurgeon preached about Jesus in this moment. And this this is a little bit long, but you can follow along if you want. This is what he said. Our Lord is the maker of the ocean and the waters that are above the firmament. That's the sky. It is his hand that stays or opens the bottles of heaven and sendeth rain upon the evil and upon the good. The sea is his and he made it and all fountains and springs are of his digging. He poureth out the streams that run among the hills, the torrents which rush down the mountains and the, the, um, the, the flowing rivers which enrich the plains. One would have said, if he were thirsty, he would not tell us, 
For all the clouds and rains would be glad to refresh his brow, and the brooks and streams would joyously flow at his feet. And yet, though he was Lord of all, he had so fully taken upon himself the form of a servant and was so perfectly made in the likeness of sinful flesh that he cried with a fainting voice, I thirst, I thirst. It's an interesting thought that Jesus who controls all waters finds himself thirsty. While he's hanging on the cross, he, he quotes uh, Psalm 22. We'll look at that in three weeks when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Psalm 22 is a fascinating psalm. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, if you read Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, you'll be blown away by the, uh, the prophecies of Christ and his crucifixion. But in Psalm 22, there's this picture of him on this cross in this condition. Psalm 22, verse 15, it says this, 14 and 15, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. All right, so on the surface, this statement of Jesus, I thirst, makes perfect sense. He is a human. He hasn't had anything to drink for 18 hours. 18 hours before this, he was in the upper room with his disciples. That's the last time he had anything to drink. He went over, he prayed to the point where he's sweating, so he's losing bodily fluids, sweat, and blood at that point. He has been scourged, so he's lost a lot of blood at this point. No doubt that he's been dehydrated. As he's been thrown down, he's been in this dust, he's been breathing this in. His, his throat and his mouth are dry and parched. He has all the anguish of carrying this cross. He goes up, he's crucified. The difficulty of breathing, every little breath, every take, exhale takes everything within him physically to do. So you think, of course, he says, I thirst. Who wouldn't thirst? I mean, even if you just didn't go through all that, but just didn't have anything to drink for 18 hours, you would say, I thirst. So we see the practicality. Of course, he would say that. It makes perfect sense. He's thirsty. He's human. Yes. But if we stop right there, we may think, this, this is kind of the outlier of these statements from the cross. This, is just, this one isn't as, as deep or profound. But you don't have to go very far at all to see that while he was physically thirsty, there was something more that was going on here. In John chapter 19, where this is recorded, in John chapter 19, verse 28, it said later, this is it's after the, the passage that, that uh, Cynthia preached on last weekend, later knowing that all was now completed. We can spend the whole time on that one. Now that, all, that, that now was, all was now completed, and so that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. He had come, he says, I came to do my Father's will. All the things that God had ordained for him to do, he had done them. They were complete. Now he's thirsty, yes, physically, but look what it says. Why does he say, I thirst? So that the scripture would be fulfilled. There's a reason beyond just his physical thirst. There's a scripture that has yet to be fulfilled. Notice it says scripture, like singular, not scriptures. But there's a scripture that needs to be fulfilled. Another one of these prophetic messianic uh, psalms is Psalm 69. And it's another one you could, you could read. In that, um, uh, Arthur Pink said that there are seven uh, different different prophecies in Psalm 69, and at this point, six of them have been fulfilled. There's just one small detail left to be fulfilled. And as he's hanging there on the cross while he's about to die, when he's gone through all that, he has the wherewithal to think, have we fulfilled all the prophecies? Oh, wait a second, there's one more. It's an amazing thought and also a beautiful picture that if God says something is going to happen, it will happen. Jesus committed to fulfilling his Father's will, knowing that there was a scripture that had yet to be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Scripture found in, in Psalm 69, verse 21, it says this. 
They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but in Mark, it talks about how they offered him some wine mixed with myrrh early on, and it was a sedative. He said no to this. But now he's saying, I'm thirsty. I thirst this, this prophecy, vinegar for my thirst. So back to John 19. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I thirst. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. On the one hand, it quenches his thirst. It's exactly what he wants. So side note, as his throat is so parched, he's preparing to say the last statements, and it's almost as if he says, I don't want to rasp these out from a dry throat. I want to be able to proclaim these very loud. We'll get to those later, like weeks later from now. So it fulfills that, but it also fulfills this prophecy that they would give him this vinegar to drink. You say, okay, well, now that makes more sense because it wasn't just a practical physical need. Well, it was. It was the fulfillment of a prophecy, and it was. But what if there was something even more? What if at that moment when he says, I thirst... It is the physical need. It is the fulfillment of prophecy. But what if he's also talking on a deeper level, a thirst that no liquid could quench? There's a a, a deeper thirst, uh, something something more. Now, it's believed that these, I know we're out of order of these, but the last three statements were probably at the very end of his crucifixion and probably came back to back to back, really close together. If that's the case... He's been hanging on the cross for about six hours now. In the last three hours, the whole earth has grown dark. And there's what is happening not only on the cross with Jesus, but it's what's happening in the cosmos because of what's happening all around and what's happening in the Godhead. And this is, this, I'm just telling you right up front, you need a smarter pastor than I am to explain this one. This is so far above my knowledge and my capacity to understand how this God who is one in three persons and what's going on there, I don't fully comprehend that. How the holy, righteous Jesus, who's never, ever sinned, is now becoming sin, and whatever is tearing apart in the Godhead, and as he's thirsting there, maybe it's because for the first time in all of eternity, there's this God turning his back on his son, and how that works out, I don't know. But when he says, I thirst, he's saying, I thirst for my Father. I thirst for God. Because the skies had grown dark and it was not just an eclipse. Eclipses don't last for three hours. And the earth was shaking and it wasn't just an earthquake. It was the very bowels of the earth writhing in pain of this Godhead being torn apart. And as we know, Jesus does quote the book of Psalms while he's hanging on the cross. And what if when he says, I thirst, he's thinking about the Psalms. The psalmist who wrote in Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. My God, I thirst for you. Never has anyone ever experienced spiritual dryness like this. Jesus becoming our sin. Or in Psalm 42 the psalm that many of us sang back in the 80s and 90s. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. Oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? You see, going into this series 
this was the week I was least looking forward to preaching because I thought, what do you get out of I thirst? So much. Yeah, the practical, physical, the fulfillment of prophecy, the final one, but this deep thirst for his father. And what if? What if there was one other thing? What if this becomes extremely personal for you and I? Let's go back to the picture from Mother Teresa's home. I thirst. What if the thirst was not just the physical, the prophecy, the Father, but for us. See, when Mother Teresa had that vision, she said Jesus looked at her and said, I thirst. And the whole reason she started, she and her sisters of charity, was to quench and to satiate the infinite thirst of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that they would do that by caring for those, the least of these, as it says in Matthew 25. Mother Teresa said these words, I thirst. I thirst is something much deeper than just Jesus saying, I love you. Don't read this too fast. I want you to sink, I want this to sink in. Until you know that don't know deep inside that Jesus thirsts for you, you can't begin to know who he wants to be for you or who he wants you to be for him. Now, this is a life changing thought. The thought that when Jesus is hanging on the cross after almost six hours, he is thirsty, but it's really more to fulfill the prophecy that he says that. And he's thirsty for his father. But while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says, I thirst for you. Jack, I thirst for you. Emma, I thirst for you. Sean, I thirst for you. Peggy, I thirst for you. Jim, I thirst for you. Gail, I thirst for you. That his great desire was that he would do this so that we could understand and experience the life he has for us. And he thirsts for you and me. While he's hanging on the cross, Jesus has his eyes fixed on you. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And today I want to end um, in a little different way. Because our worlds are so busy, our lives are so full, that maybe we don't take the appropriate time to, as the old hymn says, when I survey the wondrous cross. And I want to give you a couple of minutes in your week today to just reflect on this, that Jesus says, I thirst for you. And here's what I want to offer you. If you want, if you have your cross, maybe take that out. Or maybe you'll just close your eyes. Or maybe you'll just focus on the cross. 
But I want to read you, not in its entirety because it's extremely long. I want to read you what Mother Teresa wrote about Jesus saying, I thirst for you. And then when we're done here and in Skagit, I want you to just let Tia, Ron, the teams sing over us. Close your eyes, focus on the cross, hold the cross, let me read this. I thirst for you. It is true, I stand at the door of your heart day and night. Even when you're not listening, even when you doubt it could be me, I'm there. Waiting for even the smallest signal of your response, even the smallest suggestion of an invitation that will permit me to enter. I come with a power and a love most infinite, bringing the many gifts of my spirit. I come with my mercy, with my desire to forgive and to heal you, with a love for you that goes beyond your comprehension. I come longing to console you and give you strength, to lift you up and bind all your wounds, to bring you my light, to dispel your darkness and all your doubts. I come with my power that allows me to carry you, with my grace to touch your heart and transform your life. I come with my peace to calm your soul. Nothing in your life is unimportant to me. I have followed you through the years, and I have always loved you, even when you have strayed. I know every one of your problems. I know your needs and your worries, and yes, I know all your sins. But I'll tell you again that I love you. I love you for you, for the beauty and the dignity my Father gave you by creating you in his own image. Oh, it's a dignity you have often forgotten, a beauty you have tarnished by sin. But I love you as you are, and I have shed my blood to rescue you. I know what is in your heart. I know your loneliness and all your wounds, the rejections, the judgments, the humiliation. I carried it all before you, and I carry it all for you so you could share my strength and my victory. I know above all your need for love, how much you are thirsting for love and tenderness. Yet how many times you've desired to satisfy your thirst in vain, seeking that love with selfishness, trying to fill the void within you with passing pleasures, with the even greater emptiness of sin. Do you thirst to be loved? I love you more than you can imagine to the point of dying on a cross for you. I thirst for you. Yes, that is the only way to even begin to describe my love for you. Come to me and I will fill your heart and heal your wounds. I will make you a new creation and give you peace even in your trials. I thirst for you. You must never doubt my mercy, my desire to forgive, if you feel of little value before the eyes of this world, it doesn't matter. There is no one that interests me in the whole world than you. I thirst for you. Open up to me. Come to me. Thirst for me. Give me your life. Don't you realize that my Father already has a perfect plan to transform your life beginning from this moment? Trust in me. Ask me every day, to enter and take charge of your life, and I will. Why would I do this? Because I thirst for you. Sin can never satisfy you or bring the peace you seek. All that you have sought outside of me has only left you more empty. So do not tie yourself to the things of this world, and above all, do not run from me when you fall. Come to me without delay, because when you give me your sins, you give me the joy of being your Savior. There's nothing I cannot forgive or heal. So come now and unburden your soul, no matter how far you've strayed without a destination, no matter how often you have forgotten me. 
I want you to always remember one thing that will never change. I thirst for you. Just you. As you are. Do you find this difficult to believe? If so, look at the cross. Look at my heart that was pierced for you. Have you not understood my cross? Then listen again to the words I spoke there. For they tell you clearly why I endured all of this for you. I thirst. Yes, I thirst for you.